So <clears throat> we thought we would um, introduce a bit of a, a practical element to um, the user um, events this year. And so we've got a set of um, five common issues, um, probably slightly more than that in, in a few more details, um, which we, uh, a few of us are going to talk through. Um, and these are things that um, quite commonly come up as problems on the help desk. So it's kind of interesting to see the sorts of things that come up, but also hope to give people um, some practical solutions to some of those problems. So um, we're going to talk about uh, login problems. Uh, some stuff about home directory and uh, how to um, restore from snapshot backups, a little bit about choosing the right storage, and then I'll hand over to Fatima to talk about uh, choosing the right compute for your workflow, and then uh, Ag's going to talk about um, how to build fault tolerance um, into your workflow. So um, in under the banner of sort of login problems, I've got four um, issues here which um, we can we can look at. Um, so we've got network related things, um, sometimes there's a missing username, uh, which is an easy um, gotcha that catches a lot of people out. Um, there's the agent forwarding, uh, at old chestnut, and um, actually less of a login problem, but more of a, a problem that can be solved by logging in a different way um, with our new um, graphical desktop service. So I'll just quickly um, show that. So uh, just in terms of a context diagram, obviously we're talking about um, the, the login nodes and you'll see we've got the, the yellow normal login, login nodes and next to that we've got the um, NX login nodes, which are the ones I'll mention for the fourth um, uh, sort of subtopic there. So that's where things fit in. So that's how you access most of the other resources within Jasmine. So it's quite important to be able to do these right. So the first um, one, we'll just talk about um, uh, network issues and um, probably the symptom you'll see if you have this issue is uh, connection reset by peer or what some words to that effect essentially um the jasmine has an allow list um, which uh, restricts access to jasmine uh, from the entire internet down to um, institutions that we trust or networks that we trust and um, that have uh, contacted us to um, so that we're, we're sure that they're legitimate users of Jasmine rather than the bad guys. So um, if you like, when you um, connect from your um, university network, you will have an IP address and that should resolve to a host name like this one here, host 001 myunive.ac.uk. Um, and then that means that we can um, add to the allow list um, either individual university domains or in fact, what we do is um, white, uh, sorry, allow list we add to the allow list the whole of the star.ac.uk um, domain, but for other non-university um, domains, um, they need to be added uh, by um, um, asking the help desk. So, um, uh, as I say, normally you would connect from your institutional network. That's that's what we would expect most users to do. Um, if you connect from your home broadband, and I guess uh, this may be a, a more common issue at the moment, um, first of all, um, it's not going to be from a domain that we necessarily uh, trust or recognise. Um, also, um, it's not always the case that the IP address, the number bit, actually translates into a, um, a fully qualified host name. So that makes it more difficult for us to um, check it against the, um, the, the, the allow list. So we provide a handy tool um, at this URL here, um, which you can use to check uh, you know, if you access that URL from the machine uh, that you're planning to contact Jasmine um, uh, from, that will um, tell you, A, does it resolve to your institutional, uh, does it resolve, first of all, um, to a host name, and does it resolve to your institutional domain? Because um, it's unlikely that it'll be on the allow list uh, if it's not. And one thing you can do um, to try and mitigate that is that if, uh, you if your institution or your, your organization provides a virtual private network, a VPN, um, you can connect via that, because that makes you, on your home broadband connection, um, uh, it assigns you an IP address belonging to that trusted network. And in most cases, that should also resolve to a, uh, to a host name, which again, then can be checked against the whitelist, and off you go. Um, so that's a, a fallback solution for that, and we would recommend that you try and contact, uh, connect from your uh, institutional network uh, wherever possible. Um, 
recognising that that's not always possible, however, um, we do provide, um, instead of login uh, one, and I think there's some others, uh, there's login two dot Jasmine, and also with the graphical service, you'll see NX login two. Um, this has a slightly different set of rules to login one and four. And this means that you can connect um, from uh, your uh, home broadband connection if you need to. So the reverse DNS lookup rule is not applied. Um, there are some other rules that are applied. So you can connect, but you might be limited in what other services that you, you can access. For example, you can't get to the transfer uh, machines via, via that, um, where you can, you can log on to the transfer machines and pull data in um, uh, from within Jasmine, but you can't connect to those transfer machines directly from outside of Jasmine um, if you don't have this. There are some other data transfer services that you can use that are actually more efficient um, and those are all documented in the help document. So in, in theory, we should be able to cater for everybody. So another problem that um, sometimes catches people out is um, just forgetting to um, include the username in the SSH command. And usually the symptom for this would be um, permission denied. So uh, obviously on your local machine, your username um, might be different to your Jasmine username. So if you omit that username when you try to connect, um, either there's going to be no um, user by that name, or it will try and, if there is someone by that name already that isn't you, it will try and connect uh, to someone else's account, and either way, that, that won't succeed. Uh, so uh, when you are connecting with the login machines, uh, don't forget to use your, your username. It's quite a common problem. And then another one is uh, making an onward connection. Um, so um, the primary um, sort of use case for this is obviously going through a login machine to one of the, the sign machines. So um, on your local machine, you should have your SSH uh, private key. Um, your private key stays on your machine and your public key is what's uploaded to the Jasmine accounts portal that goes into your user profile and it's shared with all the machines that you should have access to within Jasmine automatically. Um, if you uh, include the flag to enable agent forwarding, that ensures that once you've made this initial hop to the login machine, um, you can then make the extra hop to the uh, sign machine or wherever else you need to get to within Jasmine. And if you're using command line SSH, that's the minus A option. If you're using um, mob agent or within Mobrex term, or perhaps the um, DNX uh, client, which we'll talk about in a sec, um, there's usually a tick box to enable agent forwarding, so that's important to remember. Um, just a few um, do's and don'ts about um, SSH keys as well. Obviously, um, your private key really can stay on your local machine. It shouldn't really need to go anywhere else. That's the best way to keep it secure. Um, you don't need to copy it to your Jasmine home directory. Um, you shouldn't need to because you can do this agent forwarding thing. So um, you should just keep it on your local machine um, in most cases. Um, do protect it uh, with a strong passphrase. Please do not use um, SSH keys that are unprotected. Um, that is against the rules. And also uh, don't edit your authorized keys file, which is in your SSH crypt. Um, so this is the thing that um, we use to propagate your public key out to all the um, machines within Jasmine. If you do edit it, um, it will just get overwritten. So it's, um, it, please don't um, edit that. Um, and yeah, it is um, strictly one user, one key. So um, please don't share keys with colleagues um, or uh, other people. So um, in that way, we can help keep the system secure. Nice animation now I've got to use. Right, so onto the final section of login problems. So as I say, this wasn't so much a problem, it's more just um, uh, something that you can solve by logging in a different way. So. Um, Jasmine traditionally has been a, um, a command line a terminal based um, a platform rather than a graphical uh, platform, but um, we have uh, been looking for a long time for a solution that allows us to give you better performance uh, with graphical applications. When you're using graphical applications, uh, they, are, they can be very slow. When you're sending back the graphics to your local machine over a, over a wide area network, a WAN, um, so you'll have noticed the, the, the yellow NX login nodes next to the login nodes on the um, sort of context diagram. So we're going to look at what, what, what we're talking about there. So we now have a new service uh, using a, a software um, system called No Machine NX. 
and uh, we run a server on those NX login machines. And uh, to use it, you need to download a client, uh, the NX client, uh, which is available for Windows, Linux, or Mac. And you would use that to connect instead of uh, the terminal application. Um, so you, you fire up the client and you run it. So if you just kind of watch this little video here, um, the idea is we've got a connection profile, which we've already made, just pointing at one of those nodes. Um, I'm going to just use my SSH private key. So it's connecting over SSH in the same way as you would do normally. Pasting in my um, passphrase there. And then I can start a virtual desktop on the NX server. And because it's happening through the NX client, these graphics are relayed back to my local machine really efficiently. And the performance difference is, is really quite um, uh, marked. So it's well worth doing if you do use graphical applications. So now I'm using the agent forwarding, uh, the minus A option to connect to the, um, the, the Psi 4 uh, Psi machine. And on that one, I'm just going to load up some little uh, graphical application. So I'm doing module load contrib slash panoply. Panoply is a little um, viewer for HDF and NetCDF files. And I'm starting up this graphical application. Um, so as you can see, that's just started up. There'll be a little GUI. Um, and you can see I can use that GUI. And it's pretty responsive. Um, once it's up and running, there's relatively little delay. And that's quite different to the experience that uh, you would get if you were using X11 um, graphics over a wide area network. So yeah, much better experience for graphics heavy applications. Um, and it is actually uh, the, the way you need to get to some uh, graphical tools that are available um, inside the fence. For example, the um, interface to the object storage um, is available uh, as a web-based tool, but only inside, uh, inside Jasmine itself. So for that purpose, we actually provide the Firefox browser on the NX login machines themselves. Um, so you don't even need to go to the, the sign machine. You can fire up the browser there. And from there, you can access those web-based tools that are only available inside the fence. Um, but it's often, it's also useful for many more tools um, uh, that, that use graphics in a heavy way, like IDL, um, uh, plot outputs, that kind of thing. So if you want to find out more about that, look at the, the help documents here and just search for NX. That's probably the easiest way to uh, locate those documents. So moving on then, just grab a glass of water. Um, we'll look at um, your home directory and um, snapshot backups. So your home directory on Jasmine provides uh, 100 gigabytes of space. And that's on a uh, nice, fast, solid state disk storage. Uh, which is ideal, as we've said here, for um, files, code, Python virtual environments and stuff. But it is it's worth noting it's the only file system on Jasmine which is backed up, the uh, only user file system that's backed up. Um, so regular and full incremental backups are done for you. Um, but uh, there's these all other type of backups called snapshot backups, which are sort of a little known feature that um, you might find useful. I'll have a look at those in just a second. Um, but if you want to find out, for example, how much space you're using to make sure you're within your 100 gigabyte quota, you can use the command PDU. So PDU is a special version of DU, um, which works particularly well with this type of storage. It works in parallel. And I've just applied two options there, the minus S for giving summary and uh, minus H for human readable, so in, in units that um, make sense. So I'm using 5.9 gigabytes out of my 100 gigabytes. So let's have a look now at um, how to restore from a snapshot. If, uh, and this, this is in the, uh, the help documents, by the way, so you can have a look at it there as well. If I go to um, uh, my home directory, um, which will be home users, my main, but I, I can uh, use this path here, home users dot snapshot slash um, uh, this path. And uh, this environment variable here, which just means uh, my username. I can list all the snapshots that exist um, for me of my home directory. And these will, I think I actually truncated the list here. There's a, there's a big list of these directories that will exist um, going back from yesterday, the day before. I think they're daily, I'm not quite sure how regularly they're created, but there should be one. So this is ideal for those situations where you've just accidentally deleted a file. And uh, it's a self-service way that you can restore um, files uh, to your home directory. So if you just uh, perhaps choose the most recent one of these um, directories, you can find maybe this file here, 100m.dat, 
and it's as simple as just copying back from that uh, snapshot location to your own home directory to restore that file. So that's a really handy um, thing just to remember. So finally, uh, the last section of what I wanted to talk about was just about choosing the right storage. Um, we, I showed on the, um, the context diagram previously, we've got um, a set of storage services. Um, so home directories, group workspaces, the transfer cache or XFC, Scratch, and there's also the Cedar archive. And then we've got this storage migration service, JDMA for moving data between those different types of media. Um, behind those services, we've got a range of uh, media types. And uh, so the question is, you know, what would be the right uh, choice for your particular workflow? Um, so we not, can't necessarily ask, answer that question for every, every um, use case in this little talk, but what we can do is look at some of the properties of these different uh, types of storage and just um, and learn a bit about them. So um, just using those, those uh, types of storage here um, and, and the services that they kind of are used for, we can look at this kind of grid, which shows us some of the properties of um, these, these systems. So when we talk about disk storage on Jasmine, um, normally we mean uh, POSIX disk, because um, of course um, other types of um, storage like object store are also disk based, but we really mean uh, POSIX disk file systems. So we've got three main types of POSIX file system on Jasmine, uh, PFS, parallel file system, scale out file system or SOF, and then solid state disk or SSD. Now all of these do all of these can do uh, parallel read, um, but only the parallel file system can do parallel write. Now I say that, uh, what I actually mean is that in the way we have uh, this type of storage, the soft storage configured, um, we have it configured in a way that gives us the maximum capacity. Um, because all you data hungry users out there, um, you need that capacity to store your data, to be able to share it with each other. Um, there are ways that we can configure this storage um, to be to support parallel write, but it does um, consume a lot more storage. So the default um, configuration is that it um, is, is parallel read capable, but not parallel write. It's also worth noting that there's differences in um, the abilities of this uh, um, storage to, to deal in small files as well. So small files meaning um, sort of less than 64K, um, you know, little config files, Python environments, that kind of thing. Um, so parallel file system that we have does have a capability to deal with that. It's limited. So and that, that limit can be exceeded. Um, with the uh, soft storage, uh, the way we have it configured by default does not deal well with, with small files, uh, but we are in the process of adding um, a kind of mixed file layout capability that should um, enable better dealing with um, uh, small files in a way that's transparent to you, the user. But meanwhile, we have um, uh, the solid, we've employed the solid state disk storage um, as kind of add-ons to a group workspace. So a group workspace could now consist of some soft storage, um, a small amount of so solid state disk, uh, which we call the SNF or small files area, and potentially a tape quota as well. So your group workspace might actually consist of three different media types. So yeah, onto tape. So we have um, tape is used for um, both uh, the backup for the Cedar archive. We mentioned that the Cedar archive is, is available um, throughout Jasmine read only. But the Cedar archive is hosted within Jasmine as a kind of special tenant, and it uses um, uh, tape as its primary backup for the archive. And um, there's also a staging system called the Nearline archive, which allows you to stage um, parts of data sets that otherwise wouldn't fit on disk um, for when they're needed. Also, we have a system called Elastic Tape, um, which you can use through this JDMA interface. And that is what allows you to move data that's in a group workspace between, whoops, um, between uh, uh, disk and tape storage. So then we've got Object Store, which uh, we talked about a little bit already. And I think Neil's gonna talk some more about um, later on in the uh, event. And then Block Storage, um, just to be aware of, um, used for provisioning virtual machine disks and various sort of specialist um, storage for databases, that kind of thing. 
So these are the types of storage that we employ. Um, I'm running out of my time and I knew this would happen. So I think the best thing really is to acknowledge that there are lots of different types of storage available within Jasmine. It's worth learning about their properties and capabilities, their limitations, and how you can best apply those to your workflow. There is an exercise uh, within our Jasmine workshop training materials, which you can use to um, uh, kind of teach yourself about how to select the right storage for your workflow. Um, and hopefully that will mean that um, uh, you'll, you'll run into fewer problems and be able to complete your work more efficiently. Okay. I think I'll stop there and hand over to Fatima. Thank you, Matt. I'm just going to start sharing my screen now. Hope this is visible now. Yeah, you're fine, Fatima. Okay. Um, Thank you, Matt. I'll be talking about choosing the right compute services on Jasmine. What are they? Those services, they compromise the interactive uh, compute platform, which are the Synode and Notebook, but I won't be covering Notebook. Uh, my colleague, I will cover the Notebook later on. And I'll talk about choosing the batch compute, which is our uh, cluster Lotus, uh, and which compromise um, compute nodes, CPU, uh, CPU format and GPU nodes. So let's start with the interactive compute. So the interactive compute composed of sign nodes. Um, we provide seven uh, different um, scientific analysis platform here, which are listed here um, from Sci one to Sci six and then Sci eight. Uh, they they, there's two group of uh, um, um, category of this size. There's the low spec uh, machine which are um, which has which have eight CPUs and 32 gigabytes of memory and is the high memory scientific analysis servers which is SI3, SI6 and SI8. Uh, two of the of these two two of them have one uh, terabyte each and 48 CPU cores. Access to this machine is open to all users the, through an SSH from the login node. There is no control of resource users um, um, on this uh, platform. Uh, the software stack is available is the same on this site as it is on Lotus and ac across other servers. Um, in terms of storage, uh, the, the, all the volumes like group, uh, group workspaces, home directory, access to the archive for, read, uh, for reading data is um, available. And it's in a X11, which is a graphic forwarding, is enabled on those machines. So, as I said, there's no control. So, we really want users to be aware of uh, the resources they use there and to be aware of that they are sharing that, that resource with other users. So, there has been so many, many issues that I'm going to cover here today, starting with multiple applications. Usually you, uh, people uh, use it run applications, they sit in the background, they're in sleep mode, but they are still using resources, mainly the memories. So it's always good practice before launching another application, check what is running on the system and reduce the number of processes. And there are some utilities uh, command here like PS or top command, which is quite useful to show show what is running uh, owned by the user and use the command kill followed with the process ID to reduce the number. An example of which we had in the past um, several IPython uh, instances or Emac instances running on the same machine can really affect the performance because we use more resources. And the second, um, second issue is running graphics application. Um, it can be very frustrating if the machine is overloaded, the graphics gets flaky and jittering. So the solution for this is to consider using the no machine that my colleague Matt uh, uh, presented earlier after installing the NX client. So this is kind of a way around to improve the graphics 
sent uh, to your local machine by using this uh, no machine service. It's a new service and there's plenty of uh, uh, documentation on the Jasmine uh, uh, website as well as some video tutorials. Now, high memory CPU intensive and long time processes. Why does it matter? Of course, it does. It does matter because these machines are not they are not purpose for high intensive processing of this sort, and they will degrade the performance for other users because we, we, there's no control of the resources used and the access is open for everyone unless uh, the user check the load and they decide to go to other machines. So we, it, is, it, is the, it is better to consider moving all this processing of this kind of resource requirement to the batch compute. So for more, more issues is to do with not knowing much about what the code is doing and sometimes some application can start simple and easy, not consuming that much resources, but then burst into using heavy resources. And the example of which is if you have a, um, a multi-threaded um, uh, Python or um, calling a function that is uh, spawning thread at runtime, it's not easy to know at first glance from the code that the code is multi-threaded. So I encourage monitoring here. And if, if the usage is over 90% or over 100, sometimes uh, 600 uh, percent, that is indicative is the code is re really heavy, heavy CPU and it will or will uh, impair other users on the same machine. So in this case, it's better to move this uh, processing to Lotus, or at least, if you're not unsure, use the high memory side because it has it has more cores than the, the low spec side machine side one, side one and two. And another utility is just to find out um, using one of this uh, uh, PS command with optimize t that will list the threads. Uh, just to kind of give you assurance that actually this is a multi-threaded and it is better to move it to Lotus. Another issue that has been reported is IDL development license licenses on the Psy machine are limited. And um, the, the reason being is the Psy machine are not for production run. So any code development or testing should be short and shouldn't be using the license for running hours or days on the Psy machine. So for this, consider using the Lotus because they are, the runtime license pool is uh, quite large and you can run as many jobs as, as you want on, uh, on the Lotus. Another issue to cover is um, the local TAM get filled up on the Psy machine. We, and the documentation explicitly said not, not to use the TAM on the, on the Psy machine, but there has been instances where, for example, a user installing some R packages. So R, R by default will right fill up the temp for those intermediate or auxiliary files and the user is unaware that the temp get fills and that will affect uh, affect significantly uh, the, the performance on the site and also uh, the access logging into the site will be affected because the SSH keys get stored um, on the temp. So for a resolution around this is to, to consider um, directory within the group workspace as your as a temporary directory by uh, configuring the temporary uh, environment variable for this. And um, this is also il illustrated in the documentation. And the last uh, um, issue that we have uh, noticed uh, quite often, you find people using the site for transferring data. And we know there is a site, there is a site, uh, data transfer server which are being optimized for this purpose. But there has been instances for people using it for um, moving data from the work scratch, especially those who are doing parallel write, they need to write to the uh, uh, parallel file system PFS. So for, for this, we really um, encourage users to use the bcopy service. It's an efficient way of doing parallel, of doing parallel transfer and it uses Lotus nodes. So moving now to the second type of uh, compute services available, which is the batch cluster. So the batch, the cluster is, is, is uh, um, 
composed of many holes of different specs and of different uh, number of cores and uh, CPU models. And because this resource is uh, quite big, so it needs a, a manage a system, so which is a piece of software, an intelligent piece of software to manage the usage and access to the, to the cluster. So what are the differences between interactive compute and the batch compute? The first difference is there's no direct access to the compute node. Access to the compute is always via the, the batch scheduler system, which is now slow. Um, there's no GUI um, environments uh, um, enabled on those uh, on the on the routers, and the resources are controlled here compared to the sign node. Uh, and um, Slurm does the control and uh, uh, allocate the resources uh, on a fair share. Uh, uh, fair share and also by priority. And it has a greater computing power comparing, com compared to the side and machine. There are many machines with different core, different number of processor with different uh, memory size. So it, it is the right place for large processing or production run in general. So how the, how the resources are classified here is, is through some queuing system mechanism. And I've just put here, uh, highlighted the uh, provision of a test queue which is good for um, uh, testing your code and checking what the, uh, checking and estimating the resources required, and then deciding which which uh, scheduling queue to use. And by default, the short serial queue, um, uh, even if it's not specified, uh, job submitted to Lotus will will be allocated to this queue. I mean, the queues they have different policy, they have different limitation, and an example of which gives you here the time limit, which is in number of days. Um, for the short serial test is, is kept very short because it's a test for hours and it's it can uh, accept any 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 type of workflow what is not threaded open MP, mpi so it's very it, it is a testing um, uh, uh, place for a code that is not very, that you're not familiar or code that has been passed on to you and you did a bit of development on it so what are the key issues for lotus users one of the key issues is the specification of the resources. Most of the time the resources specified in the job script is not matching the queue that was selected. Um, an example of which not being able to know what what's the code is, is it a serial, is it a mixed hybrid, does it launch, does it spawn threads at runtime, so not knowing the CPU core how much memory uh, it uses at runtime, does it burst? Uh, because some, some code, they might change the, the, how they, they, uh, they use memory of doing some uh, um, uh, random calculation or Monte Carlo calculation where the size of the array can change dramatically um, uh, during the runtime. And also whether it's, um, it's, it's a shared, um, shared or distributed uh, memory uh, uh, type of par parallelism. So where you have different process or task accessing the same memory on the node or accessing uh, um, memory uh, distributed across multiple nodes. Uh, also not being able to know how long will it take for the job to complete. So jobs will time out in this case because it's not being estimated uh, correctly. Another issue related is a CPU processor model. The reason I mentioned here because Jasmine is a heterogeneous infrastructure. We have different um, uh, computers of different model. The majority are Intel, but we have now um, uh, AMD hosts. So um, compiling on any detail and running on AMD ca can, can trigger issues. Um, and incompatibility, especially for um, um, vectorization code has been optimized to use vector unit, so that, that can that can that can impact the uh, the performance, and also job job just might fail running on AMD. Um, uh, next is which queue? So as I said, the queues here. This is just to sum to summarize. Sick and. Um, it is essential to know whether the code is sequential or parallel. What I mean by sequential, so it's it just one process. Um, parallel can be uh, multiple processes through some MPR tasks, which are uh, accessed memories um, in, a, in a distributed uh, manner, 
or, or um, um, multi-threaded, which are accessed in the memory on the node. So for sequential op codes, we have two types of serial, code, serial queues, one with a maximum time of 24 hours and another one with a long time of seven hours. If the code is serial but uses high memory, then uh, there's the high memory queue uh, for, for this. Multi-threaded application type um, OpenMP and so on, um, you can use the parse single key for this. And any distributed memory parallelism, like MPI um, um, codes, the par par multi is, 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 is used. You can, it's this, we can use the parse single as well, but it depends how, how the number, if the number of core account is high, so the par multi would, would, be, would be better to use. Then if, if not sure about the resources required, so here it is essential to do a test, and for this um, the test queue is provided. Another key issue is why a job failed. There are many reasons for a job to, to fail. So this is kind of uh, what, what I think are commonly encountered by users is Sometimes the application is executable is not found, maybe in the job script points to a, in, uh, to a location that is not accessible or the file is not there either. Um, sometimes the environment variable are not passed to the execution host. So we encourage that every environment variable should, should, should be explicitly added into the job script file. Um, this doesn't mean that if you don't add, add if, if it's not being added and you, and the user is on the shell where they are doing their development and running the code because the environment get inherited. But we're not sure if you move to another shell, it's no guarantee that the, the module are coded in place, this is the same environment. So for a productivity and efficiency, it's better to keep all the environment in the job script file. Um, another issue is job overrunning uh, because of um, are you so waiting to access uh, um, a group workspace or access the file? And sometimes these are you wait can be a symptom of file being deleted or, or file being um, um, uh, having been locked because there's another process writing to that same file. So uh, this is one of the symptoms. So make sure that it's um, you're writing in the appropriate uh, storage for this and. Uh, the file exists and you don't have concurrent jobs that one is creating a file, the other one is deleting it, and another process writing, trying to read that file that is not existing anymore. Um, another issue is some jobs um, trying to do compilation, um, the, so several jobs doing compilation at the concurrently. So some of them might run, some of them might, might uh, fail because the, the limitation on, on, the on the compiler license, for example, for Intel. So for this case, it's better to have, if it's the same uh, model or processing, it's better to have it compile it once in a single job, and then the rest of the job just use the binary of the executable. Now, the other two issues more related to the, to the storage on to, for which your job is either writing or mainly the writing, because if the group workspace, for example, get filled up, then the job will try to write is filled up. There will be waiting time when the increase and of course the job will, will just time out. And um, job also fail if they are writing to the work scratch um, and uh, the local time on the, on the host. Even we have now um, uh, an automatic uh, clear out uh, uh, to process running um, regularly or weekly to clear file that are uh, older than 28 days per time access. It, it's, it, it, it won't prevent sometimes if there's a burst of file that has been written by user that can fill up the, the work scratch. So this is for one of the reasons uh, that you can to look out when to try to find out why the job uh, failed. So we've got about two minutes, all right. Another issue is why job is pending um, during high load periods. Of course, job uh, there's many jobs and uh, demand is high and resources are not available. So job job will, will, be, will continue to pend. Uh, than the usual normal uh, like few hours or so. Um, jobs that have, require excessive resources that are not uh, 
is in the brief uh, available, like a job submitted requiring 64 calls on one node. We don't have a node with this uh, since, uh, with this uh, uh, spec. Uh, job dependency condition cannot be met, so the job will continue to depend indefinitely. And also the queuing, the priority, which is the, which is a factor that is calculated by Shadow based on the age of the job, so the queuing time and the fair share. And sometimes, well, if small jobs, you submit million of jobs at one time, that can also cause an overhead in the, sh in the shadow road to manage them together and allocate resources. So this is an example scenario of Lotus use. So I'm just gonna go quickly and just so scenario for one, for example, you have a job running that are writing small file to the group workspace um, based on the software as my colleague has uh, uh, presented earlier job is running very slow um, and then the job screen has been adapted to instead of using the, this group of the this storage system so if you use the SSD which is optimized for small uh, small file that has improved the running time from two days to a couple of hours um, and then because we're using a scratch so a job another job to do the cleaning uh, cleaning afterward is based on dependency and the job using the big copy service to move the data around so this is kind of a, sim a, a typical workflow that we expect users to follow when they are using the work scratch and also the choice of the work of the stories for a typical um for example here writing small files another scenario is a job running on the short serial queue or, but this job was trying to use more than one one cpu the job will appear running slowly, and this is quite a symptom of typical uh, job that is uh, trying to spawn threats. So we're trying to go beyond the capacity of one CPU. So in this case, job should be killed and should be submitted to the bar single with a specification of the number of the calls required. So summary, um, covering the two, the two services, which is the scientific analysis platform, we it's all about being sensible in the uh, of resources usage because we don't control the, the, uh, the resources um, and being aware of sharing because the other users are, are, uh, are on the same machine as you doing uh, other processing as you. And also a, a little knowledge of the application of the code, especially the minimum of whether it's sequential or parallel. So you can, can use which side machine, maybe use the high memory for if, if you think the code is more threaded uh, for, for testing, of course, and always think of the SI machine as a platform for development, testing, and light interactive use rather than for productions. Um, for the batch computes, always, of course, it's, it's a controlled resource, but again, for, for efficient use, it's always good to estimate the resources. So you estimate the resources required and you allocate the, the uh, appropriate queue for this. Um, whether I'm sure that the task is very short and you have 100,000 million of small tasks, maybe consider grouping some small tasks into a single job for efficiency as well, or using other features of the, uh, the batch system like job array or multi-stepping. And um, finally, use job dependency to build a workflow as it's, uh, shown in scenario one. If you're using the scratch, it would be very useful to, do, to clear the, uh, the usage of that scratch area. And uh, I will pass on now uh, to my colleague, Ag, and thank you. Thank you very much, Fatima. So I'm just gonna stop uh, sharing. Hi, everyone. So um, for those of you that, that didn't see the introduction, uh, my name is Ag Stevens and I'm the head of partnerships at CEDA. And following on nicely really from the stuff that Fatima has been talking about, um, this particular issue is about building a fault tolerant workflow on Jasmine. Um, so I mentioned workflows earlier on and um, we've done some work on this in the last um, year and a half, trying to meet the needs of a number of users that were coming to us and, and talking about you know, how you go about building a, a robust um, reliable workflow. So first of all let's just think what do we mean by a workflow? Um, I'm interpreting it as a set of tasks that need to be processed in order to complete an overall goal. Now typically many of these tasks can be run in parallel 
and in some cases there are tasks that will be dependent on the completion of others. So when we're trying to define an efficient workflow, um, there are some things that we should bear in mind. So every single task, we should be able to monitor the status of it, um, and we should be able to record the status of it once it has completed or failed. Um, and, and one of the key targets with this is that we want to have we want to be able to create a safe rerun of either a part a part of the workflow or even the entire workflow itself. So why does it need to be fault tolerant? Unfortunately, building big workflows and running them on big batch compute compute platforms. Um, inevitably mean that it's very unlikely that all of your tasks will run the first time that you try and run them. Let's say you've got a workflow made of made up of 500,000 tasks. There are lots of things that might prevent that from just running in a single go. For example, unforeseen error conditions that you just hadn't considered. Um, typically on somewhere like Jasmine, you are processing data. So there might be problems with some of the input files that cause your code to fail in some ways. And of course, there might also be system problems. So there might be issues with communications between nodes. Um, the as um, Fatima was talking about, you know, all, all these resources are shared resources, and sometimes the activity of another user may cause problems for your processes. So the key thing is that you want to build it so that you can rerun your workflow until it has run to completion. And the key thing there is that we're not rerunning the whole thing anytime. We're only rerunning the bits that didn't run before. It's maybe worth reflecting for a moment on um, the idea of an embarrassingly parallel workflow. So these are workflows where you can literally break up your task. So you've got a giant task. Say it's, I want to process 10,000 input files, but every single um, task within that overall workflow is completely independent of the others. And this kind of thing is absolutely perfect for a batch processing system like Lotus, because all you have to do is instead of looping through processes that you would run sequentially, you just farm them all out to our batch processing service and, and the jobs will all run in parallel for you. They may take a while, depending on how busy the queues are and how busy the cluster is, but you can just push all the work out and it will run on parallel and you don't care which node it's running on because you know all the same software is available on those nodes um, and you'll have tested it. And an important thing to know if you've not done any batch processing before is that batch compute is not interactive and the first lesson of that is that you cannot see it. So most of us in the olden days were used to the idea that you start running something and you watch your terminal and you can scroll back up in your terminal to see what happened and you'll either have it just um, information reporting to the terminal or you might have errors that appear there so you can you can see what's happening with batch compute it requires a different approach so you need to log things you need to know where your logs are going you need to check the status of your processes so you need to check when the things failed or succeeded and then really importantly, you need to record those successes and failures in a traceable way. And the key thing here is, is that you want to be able to easily assess how much of your overall workflow has run. And so there are various ways you can do this. So um, an example that, that we've thought about is the idea that you start with a processing unit. OK, so here on the right, you have your unit and this can be typically a small script or function that carries out an operation. Um, it's entirely predictable in that you can measure it. Um, this enables you to to test and debug the sort of foundation or the core of your workflow and it acts as the basic building block. So your unit must take an input or a set of inputs and it needs to generate some kind of output. Now, typically on Jasmine, the, the inputs are likely to be data files, the outputs are likely to be data files. But if you define a unit and you know exactly what it does, what its inputs are, what its outputs are, then it's something that you can really easily manage. So you can execute your unit 
in a piece of Python code or a command line script, any kind of executable thing um, that you can measure. And when you're building a workflow and you've got these units, units, it's really quite useful if you can run a single unit relatively quickly, because then as you're testing and prototyping, building up from that unit, you can do lots of iterations, you can fix things and build it from there. It's really, really important that you're able to define and record your successes and failures. And you do this at the level of the unit. So inside each unit, you might define a set of errors that you know might happen. So you can you might have a bad data error where you, you couldn't read the input file. You might have a processing error when there were, for some reason, whilst it was processing, um, an error was raised by your code. And then if you've done, if you've if you've taken the time to do this and you understand your unit and your code well enough, then before running each unit, your code can check if success was previously recorded. If it, if it hasn't previously run and been successful, then you run the unit, you catch any errors, and you record either the error or the success. And there are lots of different ways you can do this. Um, you could put this information in log files, you could put it in a database. Um, there's many different approaches. So one of the things that we've come up with as a way to try and help people who are moving old sequential and interactive workflows into a, a kind of batch approach is we've come up with this thing called ABC unit, okay? And this is just a, an example framework that's in a GitHub repository that you can take a look at and hopefully learn from or adapt if you want to build something like this. So we're imagining we, we have a great big workflow. It's doing lots of things, but, but we, we can define a single unit that we understand the inputs to and the outputs. So we take that individual unit and then we build a thing called a chunk. So this is the C in the name and a chunk is made up of running a series of units. The chunk itself is then a component of a batch so the B is the batch, and I think you get the idea now. We now have all, so the A is for all. So the idea behind creating a structure like this is that as, as the, uh, the controller of the workflow, you can start by working at the unit level. You can make sure your unit is predictable and makes sense. You can then um, build a chunk around it and say, well, I want to run all these things together, and you can build up from there until eventually you can potentially just have a single script that will run your whole workflow in a single go. So it's important, really important that you test at each level when building the workflow. So once you've written the unit, test it interactively on the SI servers. Does it catch the errors properly? Does it avoid rerunning after success? So what you really want to do is you run it once on a unit. If it works, you run it again and it just logs, I don't need to run again because I've done this before. So then we can build up to the chunk. And again, the chunk is still relatively small. So we can define a limited number of units that we're gonna run on within a chunk and run that interactively on the SI servers again, test that it works properly, test the results are predictable, test it's logging correctly. And then again, take it up to the next level. So we build the batch and we can run that interactively on a limited number of chunks. Now, by the time you're running the batch, you may well be running these things on Lotus. But the key thing here, again, is that you're not running the whole thing and just hoping that it works. You're building up in stages, building your confidence that your workflow is, is robust and, and is fault tolerant and managing its outputs properly. And finally, when you've done all these things, you should be safe to run the whole thing. So I'm not going to have time to talk in detail about our example, but um, here's a link to it on GitHub. So it's called ABC Unit CMIP 5 Stats. And the way it works is it, um, the, the particular example we chose was we took the, the fifth coupled model into comparison project or CMIP 5, which is a very large um, collection of climate simulations. And 
these are run for many models, many experiments, um, and for a, a whole load of other variables within within a very sort of um, multi-dimensional um, array of possible inputs. So in this example, we're saying we care about the types of stats that you might calculate. So we're cal calculating temporal statistics. So you can get the mean, the max, and the min. We are interested in the models. We are interested in um, a particular experiment in this case. So we've picked an experiment. Um, and we're interested in the ensemble members that are running and the variables or variable IDs that are running. So if we start at the top here, we have a simple run all script. So this is the thing that you can run and it will run the whole of your ABC unit. Um, in this case, we're just selecting a single statistic. So we want the mean, but we want the mean for all models, all ensembles, all variables. You can also run at the command line, run batch, and that, that gives you the option of specifying the model and the statistic. At the chunk level, we are saying you can also add the ensemble member. And then within runchunk.py, we have a function called run unit. And you give that the statistic, the model, the ensemble, and the variable ID. So we've broken up this large piece of processing into various components that get smaller and smaller and more specific and are all measurable. In terms of how this actually works on Jasmine, um, I, I believe that inside Run Batch, we actually submit all the jobs to um, Lotus that then call Run Chunk on Lotus. So as I say, we've tested Run Unit and we've tested Run Chunk interactively, but when we run the whole thing, Run All just kicks off a load of Run Batch scripts, and those Run Batch scripts then submit as many run chunk scripts as, as necessary onto Lotus. And this might be days and days of processing that needs to be done. It will all be queued on Lotus. And when there's enough free space, it will all run as it needs to run. So we have an animation of, of um, seeing this in action. Again, I'm not gonna show this now, but the, the links here, if you'd like to go away and have a look and you can just see how we run different parts of it. So just before I finish, a few things to consider about building these kind of workflows. So on Lotus, um, we have a test queue. Um, and the test queue is just about running test jobs. So start with the test queue um, when you're running your early jobs. And then you can migrate to using other queues, um, depending on the, your, your um, CPU requirements, your memory requirements, um, and, and the duration of the jobs. You might choose different queues. Getting the job size right is really important. You want to avoid too many Lotus jobs, and you also want to avoid jobs that complete very quickly. So there isn't an exact number, um, but if it looks like you're going to be running millions of jobs, that's likely to be too many. And equally, if it looks like a single job is going to run in you know, less, than, less than 30 seconds or something like that, um, that also looks like it's too many. So you're kind of looking for a sweet spot to break up your processing into a sensible number of batches, chunks, and units so that you're using the system as efficiently as you can. Um, you should think about using scratch disk, um, which may be faster than using um, your group workspace in some cases. And you might want to put temporary data on there. And, and as we say and have said many times, make sure you're clearing up your directories and outputs when you finish. So thank you very much. Um, that's all from this section. Um, please follow all those links um, if you want to find out more or, or get in touch and ask us questions.